Hello friends, Budjurina Junior Darug Nurawa. Good to see you on Darug Country. Welcome to 11 stories from the River Jurobin's audio walk at Howe and Jurobin Parks, Olga Narang, Windsor. Naya Giara Rhiannon. My name's Rhiannon. Naya Yurubarung Deer Darug Buruburongal Nuruyin. I belong to the Buruburongal Grey Kangaroo Clan of the Darug people. Bayaju Gubunga, Gununigang Yura, Guragal Yagu, Barabugu, Daragura. I pay respect to my elders, past, present, and emerging. Yanawiju, Manuiwa, Muru, Gubal Yura. Walk with me in the footsteps of our ancestors. Nara, Dabuwa, Nalari Nai, Jurabin. Listen to the story of our Jurabin. River Jurubin is our ancestor, a living, breathing being, sung into existence from creation. In Darug Dalang, Darug language, there are places along the river that speak of her body, like Narang Burai, Little Lake, and Gurugang, Kneecap, Goodbye, Arm, Mara Mara, Fingers, Nabang, Breast, Dugul, Jawbone, and Malang. Eyes. The River Jurubin is a sacred highway of connection, holding our dreaming, creation stories, and song lines across countries and nations. Jurubin tells a shared creation story of Gurungaj, the great eel. Remember, Midiga, tread softly on this dreaming. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander listeners are advised that this audio walk contains stories of historical violence and Aboriginal people now resting in the dreaming. Listen and enjoy the stories, but please don't reproduce them in any way. Didgeridoo. Thank you. Our walk begins at the back of the museum on Thompson Square. In Darug Dalung, Darug language, this area was called Bulga Narang, which translates as hill camp. We're on a hill between Jurubin and Wianamara South Creek. In the biggest of floods, this bulga hill becomes an island surrounded by flooded lowlands, a smart place to camp. Archaeological work here has revealed over 15,000 stone artifacts, axe and spearheads, tools for hunting and fishing. Our people know that we've always been here, a part of this place like the river. Nalawa, let's take a seat in the park and look out over Jurubin and the deep time history of the Burubarangal people. My name is Erin Wilkins. I am a Burrabrongal direct woman from my paternal grandfather. My mother's side of the family came out to Windsor in the 1840s from Scotland. So I have both backgrounds hovering around Windsor. The river is like the lifeblood of Aboriginal people. So the waterways give us our food, give us our livelihood. I made a transporting canoe. Everyday life was centralised around the river life for a lot of our people. We used to have a lot of our tool making workshops along the river or the creek lines. The Hawkesbury Nepean had an abundance of yams and they were a staple diet found along quite rich, fertile soil of the riverbanks. The way that we obtained our food was always in the thought of not to be greedy, not to take in excess, and to always leave it for future days ahead. So you only take what you needed at that point in time and then you let it sit. We cultivated in a sense that we were respectful to the food source, respectful to Mother Earth. 
My name's Leanne Watson. I'm a Burra woman from the Darug tribe. My connections go back to Yellamundi. The river to me means life and it's our creation story. There's an abundance of resources around the river. A lot of those resources from the river were traded all across Darug and other countries. To me, the river's very significant and it holds our creation. Ngaya Jasmine Buraburongu Darug Delang. I am Jasmine from the Great Kangaroo people of the Sydney Basin area. I am the five times great granddaughter of Maria Locke and the three times great granddaughter of Hannah Locke. Hannah Locke lived at McGrath Hill behind the pub on South Creek. My family have always lived along the Jurubbin, along the Hawkesbury River, the Jurubbin. We know that there are multiple sites of enormous eel engravings and words that mean path of the rainbow and eyes and legs and arms and throat and mouth. And so this river becomes this huge living entity that has created country. And many of the engravings are also maps of the river. We know the Gandangara story of Gurungach where he is chased through the Blue Mountains by Mirigan. So there's part of that story we have heard is that Gurungach's children started to move down through the Hawkesbury. And then when we get to the Hawkesbury around Cadai, you start having these enormous eel engravings. The eel travelled down the river. He stopped at the waterhole, drifted off to sleep. Rushing water, rivers, oceans, waves and floods. Tearing up the ground the Gurungach speeds through. When my uncle was a child, he said he remembers the river being crystal clear, being able to see right to the bottom, seeing perch and mullet and eel everywhere and the tide covering little native orchids. And you just think what an incredible place it would have been. In 1794, a small group of European settlers arrived just downstream of here, where Wianamutta, South Creek, meets Durubbin. They came by boat. Farmers who were granted land along the river took their produce to Sydney Cove by boat and returned along the river with supplies. They dubbed the area Green Hills and it became a port town with its main wharf, the hub, located directly underneath the new bridge you can see before you. As word of the fertile ground and fast growing crops spread, colonist numbers exploded with hundreds of Europeans moving in along Jurubbin within a few years. While initially welcoming of these strangers, Darug people quickly lost access to the river, yam beds and lagoons, food, resources, paths and ceremonial grounds. The farming centre of Green Hills prospered, while our people suffered immense loss. Violence followed with troops permanently stationed in a barracks here by 1795. On this bulga, this hill, which was a Narung camp and bore a ground for my people, the government precinct and civic square was established between the river and Wianamara. Around this square in 1810, Macquarie created and named the town Windsor. He named the square after Andrew Thompson, an ex-convict and successful businessman. As Chief Constable and the first ex-convict to be appointed magistrate, Thompson's home and store was located on the far side of the square and became the commercial centre of the settlement. But the success of this township and the settlers who prospered was on the backs of Aboriginal people, especially our women, our culture and law. A war was fought over this country our children were stolen, our people were killed and hunted down by government decree. Andrew Thompson was one of many settlers who led parties hunting my people down and committing massacres as they fought to retain their traditional lifestyle and access to the river. Darug people are resilient. We adapted and survived, but not without great loss and suffering, which is largely unacknowledged 
and reverberates among our people to this day. From 2011 to 2017, a tent sat on the high corner of Thompson Square, in the park which is now a roadway. Occupied 24 hours a day by peaceful protesters from Community Action for Windsor Bridge. My name's Kate McInnes. I've been part of the protest to try and protect the oldest civic space in the nation. The first thing you have to understand is the square was much bigger than it is today. This whole precinct ran from South Creek to the river and from Arndell Street to Baker Street. It was the highest point and Government Cottage was built on the very highest of those high points. It had natural springs, so there was fresh water even during a flood when the river might have got a bit silty. The heartbreak of this is they knew it was there. You could see the remains of the wharf. It was ground zero for the bridge, right over the top of the wharf, and the drain, because the drain discharges at the back of the wharf. Community Action for Windsor Bridge desperately wanted a decent traffic solution for the Hawkesbury that didn't destroy heritage. We were really worried about a four-lane highway being bulldozed through the oldest public square in Australia. Aside from destroying heritage, it was a bad traffic solution. Bridge Engineering 101 is you'd find a high ground route. And they clearly had not done that, which made us really suspicious about their motives. For nearly six years, every shift on a Monday night was done by my husband and his shift buddy. That's a pretty big commitment, and they were not the only ones. There were hundreds of people doing that sort of stuff. It brought diverse people together in a common cause, and it politicised the Hawkesbury in a way that it's never been politicised before. We had meals delivered to us, we had newspapers delivered on a daily basis at about three o'clock in the morning. Post was delivered to us in the square. Your coffees would turn up, bunches of flowers would turn up from florists. Clearly the Aboriginal tent embassy in Canberra beats its hands down, but in defence of European history it would have to be the longest running continuous occupation in Australia. Take a look at the large anchor here at the top of the Bulga Hill. Then let's head down the steps to the remains of the old bridge and the wharf. Windsor was a port for small sailing boats, cutters and sloops farmers used to transport their goods to Sydney. Here in Thompson Square in 1806, John Grono built one of the first sealers, the Governor Bly. The district became a centre of shipbuilding for ocean-going boats made from local hardwoods. The biggest of these was the Australian, at 270 tonnes and 100 feet, over 30 metres long on its deck, was the largest boat built in the colony at the time. I'm Ted Books. I'm the son of Frederick Books, whose father was Matthew. Matthew's father was John Books, and John Books was the son of Captain Alexander Books and Margaret Grano. Margaret Grano's father was John Grano, Captain John. And the sailing boats, when they come up the river, they would sail the inward tides. They couldn't go against the tides. They used to have horses here and tow them along the bank and tow the ships along. It would be from the 1800s up to probably the 1850s. A lot of the farmers along the river had their own little boats and they would cart their products down. Some used to go around to Sydney. Alexander Books used to go to Sydney in the Highland Lass, one end he built. The big anchor up in Thompson Square. That come out of the river down in Pit Town Bottoms. When they were dredging at Pit Town Bottoms, they, they found the anchor. And it's an old English anchor so there must have been ships coming up with that anchor on and lost it. John Grano came out on a ship called the Buffalo. He came up the Hawkesbury and he built the Governor Bly. He built it for Andrew Thompson. Grano was going on trips over to 
the South Island in New Zealand and down Tasmania way, sailing all the time on the Governor Bly and the Australian. Last big boat ground I built the Australian. Made them out of gum trees. Let's look out over Jerobin at the viewing platform. It's the last remains of Windsor's first bridge that was built in 1874 and demolished in 2020 after this new bridge was built despite strong community opposition. Prior to the 1874 bridge, a punt operated here across the river. There was a punt and in fact the punt house is visible below the doctor's house in early paintings. The importance of Windsor Bridge was it was the first example of a bridge built using pneumatic caissons in Australia. The bridge was built after the Great Flood of 1867. So the bridge designers knew that they had to deal with catastrophic floods. So it's very stripped down to reduce its presence in the water during the flood. The cast iron columns are very slender and the iron itself is probably the earliest native ore that was ever smelted in Australia. In 1922, they then replaced that timber deck with a concrete deck. This is really early use of concrete. It's about 30 years in advance of them pre-casting concrete to use in bridge structures. It was listed on the State Heritage Register. So they had registered Windsor Bridge as being historically significant. The doctor's house Kate was talking about is the last house on Thompson Square, just behind us. The 1867 flood she mentioned is the highest on record at 19.6 metres. The river rose to lap the first floor balcony on the doctor's house. In the 1814 flood, the punt ferry was beached in Thompson Square and shipbuilder John Grono was called in to repair it. A report from the 1864 flood revealed so high had the foaming element overflowed the banks of the Hawkesbury River that the water rose up to the side of Dr Day's old residence, carrying before it the homesteads, furniture and farming implements, the hard-earned property of many an honest settler. A good portion of Wilberforce was underwater and the river was rising. The Emu Plains punt had broken adrift from Penrith and was fastened to a large tree on the Wilberforce side of the ferry. Edward Knapp, the Maitland Mercury and Hunter River General Advertiser. June 16, 1864. Let's head down to the current wharf now, beyond the new bridge. John Howe operated the punt here. The Riverside Park we will walk along is named after him. Howe was the district's longest serving constable and chief constable. In 1820, he led an expedition to find a route north to the Hunter Valley, which is where the road over Windsor Bridge ultimately leads, becoming Putty or Singleton Road. This was an Aboriginal track, like many of the main roads in and around Sydney. Howe was one of many explorers guided by Aboriginal people. Grace Carskins, Emeritus Professor of History at the University of New South Wales, an author of People of the River. Miles, or his Aboriginal name was Myram. He and his brother Yuranbi had been stolen as toddlers and taken by a farmer called William Giles. He was an ex-convict and his wife Mary and brought up in their home. Now this is a very common phenomenon and really is part of colonisation and frontier war. Possibly one in three, one in four settlers had Aboriginal children from toddlers growing up in their households. The thing about these children is that when they grew up, in most cases, they returned to their own people. They became initiated, educated, and they often became resistance fighters on the Hawkesbury. And Miles, or Myram, his proper name, he was head of the list. Governor Macquarie's most wanted list of resistance fighters in 1816 that was published in the Sydney Gazette. So here's this great enemy of colonisation and yet three years later Miles Myram 
is leading a party of white men up into the Hunter Valley and showing them the way. The rugged route that they found follows today's Putty Road or Bulga Road, and that became a major stock route. And then Mariam became the leader of his group, the Richmond tribe, for many years. Windsor's wharves have always been at the mercy of the river flooding. There were 27 major floods in the 19th century. The small rowing vessels of farmers were easily nudged ashore and needed no wharf. So the first wharf built here in 1795 was used only by government vessels, but washed away in the 1799 flood, which settlers acknowledged Aboriginal people knew was coming. Right above the wharf in the square were the stores where grain waited to be shipped to Sydney. The Aboriginal people certainly knew about floods because there had been a big flood in 1788, not long after the First Fleet arrived, and there had been one before that around 1780. The history of that was that some of the Aboriginal men climbed into the tallest trees on the river and we had river flat forest and they were massive. They were up to 50 to 60 metres tall. They climbed to the top and they were swept out by the water. The river's really ancient. It's been flooding as long as people have been here. And I did intense research on the 1806 flood, which was a, a huge one. It was a real shock to the settlers because they'd had big ones, but nothing like that. And they'd got a regular food source from the Hawkesbury and they celebrated the Hawkesbury. And to have this flood go through and wreck everything just came at the wrong time and washed away all the wheat and the corn that had been harvested. Yeah, because it was March. They had everything in storage and just went all the, all the way down the river. So they were terrified there'd be a food shortage. But Governor King was really concerned about this. And of course, they want to know if it's going to happen again. So they asked the Aboriginal people. And that's where the story came from. And it's actually in historical records of New South Wales. Flood history, as we know, is very much part of the Hawkesbury story for both peoples. <laughs> In 1809, floods brought more major losses and acting Governor Patterson warned flooding meant Hawkesbury could not be relied upon as the colony's main food supply. In 1812, over 100 voyages down the river to Sydney were made by small vessels, mainly owned by farmers and carrying their goods. There were often a dozen boats anchored off the wharf. In 1814, Macquarie commenced work on a much bigger wharf which he expanded to 85 metres long the next year, projecting nine metres into the river. But floods in 1817 left only a mess of tangled posts, shown in a painting by Captain James Wallace. Architect Francis Greenway was called in to design a stronger fifth government wharf, completed in 1820, which was again replaced in 1864. Remains of these wharves and an extensive brick barrel drainage system built by Macquarie to enter the river behind the wharf were identified in a recent archaeological study. The brick barrel drains are still largely in situ underground below the new bridge's roadway approach. Flooding in March 2022 washed the current jetty down the river where it was tied up at Leeds Vale. Let's leave the wharf now and start walking back under the bridge and along the walkway through Howe Park. Volunteers from Windsor Wharf Bush Regeneration Group have done lots of work around this area. Hawkesbury City Council's Community Bush Care Officer, Marty Gauchy. There's a bush care group called the Windsor Wharf Bush Care Group, right on the wharf there. They've had kidneys there, they've also had the little blue wrens and they've had water dragons. There was all weed men and now they're weeding and everything and creating this diversity of plants. The native animals will start coming back. Yeah, fascinating. We've got about 12, 13 bush care sites throughout the Hawkesbury. And that's where the community have taken ownership of that site and they meet there regularly. And they do what's called bushland regeneration, where they're slowly, very slowly restoring the site. It's so easy to just get rid of the weeds really quick. But the hard part is, 
maintaining the weeds that will come back after. So it's helping the riverbank. So when you saw that, say, so with the floods come in, a lot of riverbank was getting washed away. That was usually of an area, say, that was just grassed and then had trees around. But it didn't have all that strata level of vegetation. So depending on what type of flood came and what level the river was, that whole riverbank was to be able to bend and flow and stabilise the riverbank. So that's why it's important to have that diversity of veget native vegetation all the way up the riverbank to combat with a different type and intensity level of flooding. So when people mow the, the riverbank all the way down to the river, they just have a few trees, that kaikiyu can't necessarily stabilise the riverbank because it's not slowing the water down. And as the water's just flowing and swirling around those single trees that are planted every 10 metres, that's actually causing that, all that swirling effect and it's going to start churning up and, and eroding and then you're going to get a riverbank collapse. Keep walking along the path till the next viewing platform, opposite Windsor Beach. As the riverbanks were cleared for farming, they began to erode and wash into the river, causing siltation, where the river fills with sand and clay particles. While Windsor started out as a port town, by 1864, only small boats were able to navigate the river. Grazing and logging further destabilised banks, creating greater potential for floods to spread rapidly and wash away topsoil. The construction of the railway through the mountains sent more silt down the river, and when it opened in 1864, the river was no longer the favoured means of transporting crops to Sydney. By the end of the 19th century, siltation made Windsor inaccessible to steamships. At the end of this reach, where Rickaby's Creek joins the river and it bends into Argyle and Freeman's Reach, the river banks have been repeatedly swept away by floodwaters. Between 1869 and 1898, Three hectares of the 12 hectare Copes farm were washed away in floods. The 1925 flood cut away 135 metres of river frontage on Freeman's Reach and one hectare of Cordner's farm on Argyle Reach was redeposited downstream. Floods in 2021 and 2022 also tore into the banks on Freeman's Reach. My name's Tom Hubble. I'm a engineering geologist that works on landsliding in aquatic environments and I've done a fair bit of work on the Hawkesbury Nepean. Well vegetated banks and well vegetated, well covered riparian and floodplain forests really slow down the speed at which the water can move through so it reduces the erosive impact. The thing that I found further upstream it was where the vegetation had been left intact, the banks were much more resistant to the erosive power and the large floods that came through in the 50s and the 60s. The tree roots actually reinforce the bank soils in much the same way that reinforcing steel is used to strengthen concrete. The Australian species are really deep rooting. The roots can actually reach all the way down to the low flow level. So some of the eucalypts in particular that might be right on top of the banks, their roots can reach all the way to the water level of the river. And so that really stabilizes the river in this channel. And that is actually responsible for an interesting characteristic of a lot of Australia's east coast rivers is that they're relatively deep and not very wide, so they're narrow, deep channels. And that's partly a consequence of the characteristics of the tree roots of those riverside trees in the riparian zone, floodplain forests. Jen Dolan, Head of Sustainability Education at Western Sydney University. What we do on the banks of the river impacts what's in the river. If you've got vegetation along the riverbanks, particularly you know, native species, not just one species of weed, you're creating your own micro world. So you're creating a world of trees and plants and undergrowth and insects. From insects you get birds and then insects drop into the river and from there the bass eat the insects and eels come and eat the baby bass and then the little, you know, so it's a whole 
systemic integration from just thinking about a river as a strip of water, the riparian banks actually shore up a healthy river system. This legislation in place, but the will to actually enforce it and push it through is simply not at a local council level because they're exhausted and under-resourced. And if you look at EPA, you are the monitoring body, it's a fractured system of policy and legislation dysfunction. Let's get this right. This is the most incredible river system, I believe, in Australia. At the viewing platform opposite Windsor Beach, we're at the end of Cable Street, named after Henry Cable, another convict who became a successful boat builder in Sydney with Underwood and Lord. He moved to Windsor in 1811, where he operated a brewery and store. Sharon Lamb is a descendant. He committed a crime with his father and uh, his uncle in England, oh, up near Norwich. It wasn't just a small crime, you know, that's sad to say. It was quite the whole, practically the whole household of goods were stolen. They were brazen enough to actually cook a meal for themselves in the kitchen. <laughs> we laugh about that story. And um, the horse hoofs led them back to the uncle's house. <laughs> this is a story that we've been told. And then Henry got reprieved because he was only young. In England at that time, I think all the men became craftsmen. They had all these trade skills. And when the Industrial Revolution came into London, it basically put everyone that had a trade out of work because they didn't know how to work the machines. So it caused a lot of poverty in England. You know, they were forced to go out and rob people that were rich to survive. That would have been quite sad, you know. Big families left over there with no means of income. He owned the whole block. He owned from Bridge, Macquarie, Baker and George. He started to build sloops to go up the river to transport the maize or whatever they were growing at the time down the river to Sydney. And also bring rum up and other supplies and then people, you know, the transport way. Well, they used to bring shells up from the coast. These shells were used to melt down, down near the shoreline and used as mortar. Henry had ships, a lot of his ships did go down whaling. Because it's on the hill there, he picked that spot so he could see the ships come up the river. Let's keep walking along the path. We'll soon pass the end of Fitzgerald Street. Hayden's private wharf operated nearby in the early 1800s. Hayden was the main innkeeper and its usual stock and trade was barrels of rum. But during the 1816 floods, it was a hub for small rescue vessels and salvaged stock. For many direct descendants of the river, family stories, cultural knowledge, language and identity was hidden, stolen or buried in a web of government policy, racism and the will to survive. This country, which to us is our mother, tended by our ancestors for countless generations, was assumed by the British government and gifted to the colonising settlers. It became a means to turn a profit, to be sold or handed down to settlers' descendants. For our people, five or so generations after colonisation, very few of us have legal ownership of land here. Darig educator Erin Wilkins. So I grew up not knowing any of my Aboriginal history. I remember asking my nan why she was always so dark and I would not get a response that was the same. So every time I asked, there'd be another reason. So she'd be French, she'd be Polynesian, she'd be Maori, she'd be whatever she could think of, but she would never admit that she was Aboriginal to me. But there was a lot of stories that didn't make sense. I think parts of dreaming stories that were never linked as dreaming stories, parts of language. Nan had either come from a grassroots adoption 
or she was a part of that stolen generation and we're not too sure. We know that there was a lot of dislocation. My mum recalls conversations she's had with my nan's siblings where they've mentioned she didn't belong in that family. She wasn't part of that family. We're still trying to find the pieces to how she was shifted from her biological parents into the family that she grew up knowing. She was finally placed with an Aboriginal family in Cowra. Lots of different little things come together after a while and they make sense now, but it, you, you don't understand why would they say that or what did that mean or why, because there was always that link missing. My dad never said anything to me. They knew. They just weren't allowed to talk about it. My uncle was actually very, very surprised when I came out with that to my cousins. It was very hush-hush. When I came out to Windsor, I connected with Annie Edna Watson and a few other elders under the wings of Annie Edna. She guided me on my cultural journey into my place and my knowledge now. I think I yearned probably to know more once I found out I was Darig, and that's when I kind of delved a lot deeper into finding different sites and understanding where my culture kind of hit the ground or where it went underground or when it kind of was revived again. So that, that's been my biggest thing in my cultural journey, and still is today, is to bring back the knowledge that was buried. You may by now have walked past a concrete water tank at the end of Johnston Street, a marker of Windsor's town water supply. If you glance up the hill towards Union Lane, you can see a high tower, which was the town water store, pumped to, directly from the river, from 1889 until 1976, when the North Richmond off-river water supply took over. A small pump house down here on the riverbank housed the steam engine driven pump. Prior to 1889, water carriers would fill wooden casks at the wharf and charge for delivery. The river is still the source of now treated drinking water for the local townships. Treated wastewater is also released into the river system across Western Sydney. While collecting water samples for testing with aquatic management students from Western Sydney University, we came along the river just downstream of the bridge with technical officer Sue Cuspert. I've been involved with doing some work on this river for students for 34 years. Yeah, we've been using these sites for a long time. There's been a lot of change in the river. When I first started here, this used to be dredged. It had a sand dredge attached just here. And I think the sand dredging station was over here. It was a private lease. The river was actually quite a bit deeper then because they would dredge the sand out of it. So it had more of a deeper channel in the centre. And that's a leftover from the dredging days. The trouble with the dredging was that it also took a lot of the natural water weed away. And also you got faster flows and it, there's a lot more water pushed down. 30 years ago it was probably more polluted than it is now. And because we had so many sewage treatment plants that ran into the river and it wasn't treated anywhere near as well as it is now. We had lots and lots of blue-green algae. I mean, it's not great now, but the water that's coming in is actually a better quality than what it was, so that's a positive. We have a lot more construction, so we have a lot more turbidity problems. All of the housing developments, they don't actually put in the right sediment controls. That's not policed very well. So we do have a lot more turbidity than what we ever did. We were contracted by Sydney Water, but it wasn't called that then, to actually do the whole Hawkesbury Nepean river system first four days of every month. And we had about 56 sites along the river. When I was first on the river, we were doing water samples. All of where the turf is, they were all vegetable farms or citrus. And so 
they can have the same sort of nitrates and phosphates going in. Turf farm runoff is a huge problem with nutrients. Because these are floodplains, there's beautiful soil. Yeah. So it was, it was basically Sydney's food bowl. I find it a real shame that grass is worth, worth more for a farmer to grow than what it is to grow food. That's a real shame and, a, and I think that says a lot for society. The fertile floodplains of the Hawkesbury River and its tributaries are home to Australia's largest turf industry, 25% of national production. The river is the prime irrigator to this industry, with a wholesale value of over $70 million per annum. Turf is one of the Hawkesbury's largest industries. The continual loss of fruit and vegetable crops from flooding turned a lot of farmers on the floodplain to turf. During larger floods, such as the 1961 flood at 14.9 metres here in Windsor, the largest in living memory, Holland's paddock here on our left, behind the Riverview Shopping Centre, is the point where the river rises to merge with Wianamata South Creek and cut Windsor into two islands. Let's keep walking along the riverside path. Hawkesbury locals, Ted Books and Ron Mayles. The 61 flood was the biggest flood in our time and the reason that was a big flood, Warragamba Dam was finished in 1960. So what did they do? They let it fill right up and they couldn't stop it from overflowing. And it came down, it was rising three foot an hour here at Windsor. And ever since, you can't talk to the experts about a method to stop that from happening. And I keep saying, like they're wanting to build the dam up, that's the wrong thing. So they build it up, they're still going to have problems releasing the water. I've been in Windsor, Mal's parents lived in Windsor, and we've seen all the floods there. And we've seen the floods that from, uh, you know where the old pitch theatre in Windsor is? It came through beside the pitch theatre and out into where the car yards are, just alongside the hospital. South Creek and the river met there. So one end of the town was cut off from the other end of the town. Through, just through that hollow. Riverview would have been flooded right through there. It would have been right up to the floor in Riverview there. All the car park would be under. The whole of this extensive settlement is one uninterrupted sheet of water. The river has formed a juncture with the South Creek across the hills through Rickaby's grounds upon the riverside and those of the Reverend Mr Marsden on the creek. The danger encroached with a rapidity never before witnessed. In one alarming instance, a young man, a settler, his wife and three children were seated on a ladder laying across the fork of a tree, in which situation they contrived to sustain an equilibrium for nearly three hours. The man, a great part of the time clinging by his hands at the end of the ladder. But alas, yielding to fatigue, he forsook his hold, and all were in consequence precipitated into the deluge. The woman and children were picked up, but the fate of the unfortunate man is doubtful. Sydney Gazette, August 6, 1809. <laughs> Thomas Rickaby was an ex-convict, appointed Chief Constable at Hawkesbury in 1798 and had 80 acres over two properties on the river right here. One up on the ridge above us to our left and the other we will arrive on as we cross Rickaby's Creek into Jerubbin Park. In 1802, Rickaby went to the aid of an Aboriginal woman and newborn baby, reported by the Sydney Gazette as being barbarously mangled by a tomahawk and left to expire of her wounds, the faultless innocent clinging to her breast. Rickaby rescued the woman and saw she was looked after. She slowly recovered her health, but he took the child home and adopted it. In 1805, the child was baptised Thomas Pilot Rickaby. The bridge over Rickaby's Creek on Cornwallis Road is named after him. <laughs> 
It's not only the taking of land, it's also because they broke laws. They broke all kinds of moral laws. They stole Aboriginal women and raped them. And they stole Aboriginal children, mostly babies and toddlers. Can you imagine? That's the worst grief ever. It's a very common English colonial practice, unfortunately. Lots of reasons. One is as a pet, like they capture exotic birds and koalas and things like that and had this child. Another reason was to, what they used to say, train them up. So a free servant, basically, in the house. There is one more reason which I found evidence for, and that is child hunger. A lot of people had already been on hulks. They'd been, you know, in prisons in England. They'd got older, they'd been sick, and some of them couldn't have babies. A lot of the people who took children didn't have their own children. It doesn't make it right, but it's another reason why it could have happened. And I think it's been underestimated in historical accounts that this constant law breaking is causing them to be punished under Aboriginal law. Uh, and that's why some people are targeted for doing what they do. As we cross over Rickaby's Creek into Jurubbin Park, we're arriving on the lowlands known as Cornwallis, on the reach of the river named Argyle Reach. Just beyond here and behind the riverside farms is Baker's Lagoon, one of the largest lagoons on the floodplain. Baker's Lagoon would have been a rich gathering and hunting ground for our people, and this area was a hot spot for conflict in the early days of settlement. Rickaby attempted to bring some of his neighbours to justice, for the killing of two Aboriginal boys here in 1799, acting on the report of one of his neighbours, Mary Archer. On the same farms in 1794, an Aboriginal boy had been killed, but at that time, none of the neighbours were willing to testify against each other, and so no finding could be made. They are classic cases of people who move between the settlers and the Aboriginal people. They there wasn't a boundary and the, the frontier is not a place with black people on one side and white on the other. There's this frontier zone, or some people call it a contact zone, where people move across all the time. A lot of farms had Aboriginal people living on them. A lot of farmers shared their maize crop with Aboriginal people, not only because they were lively and generous and kind, but because they didn't want to get their house burned down and themselves speared, basically. It's insurance, so it's quite sensible. But the people who wouldn't share and had guns, they were the dangerous ones, and it's often over theft of children, but often over women, that things flare up. It's what sparked some of the murders of settlers. Some of them were innocent, but you see, if you're the friend of a guilty person, then you're guilty too. So it's a communal guilt. It's not, it's not like British justice, which is supposed to only punish the individual guilty person. If you're guilty, your family's guilty as well. If you're not there, they can bear your punishment. Historian Jan Barclay-Jack author of Hawkesbury Settlement revealed. In 1799, Hodgkinson arranged to go hunting in the area just below Springwood and he took with him John Wimber, who was a hunter. Unfortunately, Wimber had taken one of the Aboriginal women to live with him and they had not received permission from the tribe that this union take place. And so there was a retribution killing on the hunting excursion of the two hunters. When they didn't return, the soldiers and a party of settlers went looking for them and then they found the bodies. They were very distressed at the condition of them from the wounds that were inflicted by the Aboriginal weapons. The settlers in that Cornwallis area, almost all of them in that same little cluster were intent on revenge and unknowingly in the spirit of the communication with the farmers and the young Aboriginal people they were still coming into the farm and then the next time a young Aboriginal came, his name was Jemmy, he told Archer that he could bring Hoskinson's gun so they agreed that he would bring it in. When he and another Aboriginal boy called Little George came into the settlement with the gun, they were intercepted before they could get to Archer by one of the workers. And he took them into Forrester's hut where he worked and they were just about to have a meal. Everything was calm and 
Metcalf left and went across to take the gun to the widow, Hoskinson. She was intent on revenge. They gathered a lot of workers on the way from other huts. They came back into the Forrester hut and at that point they became aggressive to the boys and they tied them up and they proceeded to do a revenge killing. They buried them nearby and nothing was said, nobody murmured, just like five years previously. But one of the settlers' wives was a very brave and upright person and she knew them as friends. They knew the Aboriginal people's names. You know, they interacted with them on an almost daily basis. And she went to the Chief Constable Thomas Rickaby and reported the murder. Rickaby gathered some of the constables and went to investigate. They exhumed the bodies and one of the boys, they were only quite young teenagers, had his head almost severed from his body. He had cutlass wounds and they'd been shot and stabbed as well multiple times. So it was obvious that it was straight murder and he took all the people who'd been involved in that initial confrontation into custody and it became the very first court case where settlers were tried for the murder of Aboriginal people. They tried to have a court case several times before for murders, but they couldn't get witnesses to come to court. And so this was the very first time. When it went to court, the verdict went to murder. But when it came time to sentence, there was a real apprehension that this hadn't been done before and this was happening all the time everywhere. And the governor felt it was beyond him. So he sent to Britain and waited judgment it took two years before they got the verdict and the answer had been that while they were going to be exonerated in future, there was to be very harsh punishment for anybody who was convicted of murdering an Aboriginal person. For the first time, the settlers knew they weren't going to get away with seeking revenge on Aboriginal people. It was quite interesting that it was a woman from the settlement who came forward and was prepared to bring this to the light that it deserved. Because they'd already buried the bodies and if nobody had said anything, they would have got away with it. Sadly, this was not an isolated incident. In seeking to retain access to the river, resources, ceremonial grounds, and to uphold our law, Aboriginal warriors, both men and women, strategically raided outlying farms and collected settlers' maize growing on the riverbanks, where our people had cultivated yams. Following a series of attacks downriver in 1804, a party of seven settlers set out in pursuit and stumbled on a large inter-clan gathering of 300 Aboriginal people. Soldiers also set out in pursuit from their barracks in Thompson Square, raided the Darug family group living in the Green Hills area and shot and killed Darug leaders Major White and Nabin. Major White was one of the men who had murdered Hodgkinson and Wimbo five years earlier. The banks of Jerubbin in this area were the site of the first recorded massacre of Aboriginal people by settlers in 1794 and the first recorded massacre of Aboriginal people by soldiers in 1795. Warami, Warami, Nami, good to see you. Very good, so I welcome you to Darug Country. Rickaby's Creek runs behind Windsor South Public School, where I teach Darug Delung, our language, to a new generation of Aboriginal kids. Danaga, Danaga, Bianga, for father, German sister, Babana, brother. Very good. And a lot of our language 
it's connected to our country. So for example, the double A that we have in our words, so like wagon, like the crow, like wagon. 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 It's okay. If you hear the bird noise, it goes ah, ah, ah. And that's the same sound that we have in our language. So a lot of our language actually comes from country. In classrooms all over the Hawkesbury and all over Sydney, you have this huge range of kids that identify as being Aboriginal and they just look like everyone else. You know, just their existence is extraordinary and that they know that they're Aboriginal is quite amazing as well because it's only a very contemporary thing where you're allowed to say that. Language is definitely culture. I think it's the most important thing for reconciliation in Australia. If they had done it right, we would have been a bilingual country with multiple different languages and we all would have been bilingual in Australian languages. When you understand how Australian languages work, you realise that they actually have a lot of things in common and they say that 80% of it is the same. We all pretty much on the East Coast up into the Northern Territory share a very similar sound system even with the way that we pronounce things and so when you know a few basic rules it's very easy to understand the language and so then you would be moving through different countries being able to read language speak language and understand it which is absolutely fascinating Once you reach the end of Jerubbin Park, you might like to start heading back to the museum at your own pace. There are cattle, vegetables, horses, turf, fruit and nut trees still being farmed on the lowlands between Richmond and Windsor. Farmer Bruce Gardner was a boy when his family moved to Cornwallis in the 1920s. When they first went to Cornwallis, they grew vegetables to start off with and about February 1930, they decided to plant orange trees. They planted quite a few orange trees, but it takes them about five or six years to bear to get any money from them, so they had to grow vegetables like cauliflowers and potatoes and corn and um, that sort of thing for quite a few years. In the fairly early 40s, we went right out of vegetables into citrus. We were very lucky actually, we lived on the property uh, for 20 years, but uh, 1949 the first flood went right halfway up the walls in the house. That really shocked us, you know, we, uh, we lost just about all our crop. So you've worked for a year for nothing and then you've got to work another year before you get anything else. See, this is this is a hard part with citrus. It, uh, you only get one crop a year. If you've got vegetables, of course, you might get another chance to get a crop in and get some money. And then after that, of course, we got quite a few floods. We got the 56 flood. My brother was living in the house then and lost everything, lost all the furniture and all their clothes, just got out with what they stood up in, you know. We lost our crop. We had a lot of sand that we had to shift out from between the trees, which was quite a job. From when they're uh, at their highest until you can get back on the property is usually about five days. They're the five or six longest days, <laughs> you know, that uh, you can imagine. Besides losing your crop and everything, it makes so much work, you know, with the there's all so much debris and tins and bottles and rafts and everything to clean up after the flood. Uh, I think it was the 1961 flood. I was going with another chap. He had a house down there. We got an army duck to take us down to try and get some stuff out of his house. And we saw one chap in the loft of an old shed, so we went to pick him up and we discovered that his friend the night before decided to try to get to Windsor and uh, they found him after the flood went down, he'd been drowned. I don't think he's been drowned down there since the Either family and that was 1867. Oh, 
In the flood of June 1867, William and Thomas Ether, farmers living at Cornwallis, were driven by floodwaters onto the roofs of their houses with their wives and 11 children to await help. When a rescue boat finally arrived, they found a man in one tree and a man and a boy 50 yards up the river on a willow tree. One of the men told how they could see the boat leaving Richmond, but that the two women and the children had disappeared into the floodwaters before the boat arrived. It's the greatest known loss of life from flooding on the Hawkesbury. We were about 200 yards from my brother Thomas's. We had been there Thursday night, 20th. On Friday night, I was washed away by the wave. I heard the screams of my wife and children, but could not see them. I fastened myself to a tree, and in a short time was rescued by a boat. Hi, my name is Una Sherrard. I'm the composer and producer of 11 Stories from the River Jurubbin. Here in Durabin Park in 2019, I was joined by students from Windsor Public workshopping rhythmic variations on the number 11, breaking 11 down into twos and threes. On the beat, one, two, three, one, two, yeah. one, two, three equals 11. We thought we could do something with our feet. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. There are 11 audio walks or stories in this project. And the music you've been listening to is written in 11 parts and 11 time. Along with pi, 11 is one of the mathematically significant numbers to rivers. I'm Kirsty Fryers. I'm a professor in the School of Natural Sciences at Macquarie University. I study the processes by which water shapes the Earth's surface. The bends of a river will slowly move across the valley floor and that occurs because there's erosion on the outside of a meander bend and deposition on the inside of a meander bend. It's like how a snake moves or an eel. Luna Leopold did develop a theory of meander bends and the theory is that the meander wavelength, so along the axis between two meander bends, if you measure that length, that should equal 11 times the channel width for alluvial rivers. So if the snake is moving through sand, it will create these beautiful symmetrical meander bends. But if there's obstructions like bedrock or other sorts of resistant materials, then it won't be as symmetrical and there'll be lumps and bumps that occur along that pathway. I would describe the Hawkesbury as a not quite symmetrical snake. You'll tend to get pockets of floodplain that occur along the valley bottom and those floodplain pockets will tend to occur on the insides of the meander bends. There's pockets of floodplain that can be reworked and where the channel might move into those locations. Around about 100 years ago, my family lived here and then they moved away. I live down actually pretty close to the river. We used to have a boat and we used to go out on the river quite a bit. I know that there's supposedly a river monster in the river. I didn't know the name but I forgot it. Every now and then we'll come down to the river and we'll just like play around there sometimes and have fun together. I get really peeved that people put rubbish in the river like, like the river isn't important when we all know that it's an important part of Australia's history. We've always lived down near the river and me and my papa and nan always like to go down to the river and just chill out there. I'm told that a lot of the turf farms around the river has like a lot of pollution leaking into the river. Both my parents' houses are on the river. One did low put and right on the river and I like waking up most mornings and going swimming and wakeboarding. I'm really peeved about how much there is in the river and I wish it was really clean. That would make you go swimming in it. I just moved here this year and knowing every like stories about the river is like really cool. Didgeri Gora, thanks for your company.
We hope you've enjoyed 11 stories from the River Jurubbins, Howe and Jurubbin Park's audio walk, Bulga Narang, Windsor. For more information, please see Hawkesbury Regional Museum's website. There are 10 other audio walks along Jurubbin you can download from there.